Simpson. I'm the collections manager of fossil vertebrates and the head of geological collections. And uh, we're gonna have sort of a two part presentation uh, today. I'm going to speak about the Sioux project, our big T-Rex uh, from a PowerPoint for maybe a half an hour, something like that. And then we're gonna walk around uh, the room. Although I have a background on, I'm actually talking to you from one of our big collection ranges. This one is the uh, vertebrate paleontology oversized range, which is two stories underground. So uh, it, it may be a little bit of a challenge uh, using a, a, a cell phone to get a reception down here, but we think it's gonna work pretty well. Uh, we'll see, but be patient with us uh, as we transition into the uh, walking around part of uh, the event today. All right, so let's get started talking about Sue. So I've broken the talk into three pieces. Uh, the first section uh, is 1997 to 2000, uh, when we purchased Sue, uh, prepared, studied, mounted it, and unveiled it to the public. And then the intervening 18 years. And then the last part where we took Sue apart, moved it, and uh, I'll show you uh, the new mount and the new hall. So let's talk about the purchase of Sue. In the summer of 1997, John McCarter, the president of the Field Museum, approached me and my boss, John Flynn, and asked us to accompany him to New York uh, to look at a dinosaur, the, what was supposedly the most complete T-Rex known, which was gonna go up for auction that fall in October. And so the three of us took sort of a field trip to New York John Flynn was there to confirm that Sue was as complete as they were saying it was. And I was there as chief preparator. Let me tell you a little bit about what a preparator is. A preparator is the person who takes the rock or matrix as we call it. We've got fancy jargon for everything in our field. But, uh, the person who takes the rock off of the bones so that the bones can be seen and studied. And sometimes like in this case, actually put on exhibit though most of our research collection is not on exhibit. So uh, both, both of us uh, accompanied our president, Field Museum president. Uh, John Flynn uh, confirmed that Sue was as complete as they said it was. And here's the diagram. Uh, after we were completely done preparing uh, Sue, once we saw all of the bones, this is how complete Sue is missing only the, the parts in red. And I gave a thumbs up. Uh, the, the bone was quite well preserved. Uh, not all fossils can be mounted, but we knew that we were gonna wanna mount this into a skeleton. And uh, the rock around the bones was soft enough that it could be done by the year 2000. Our uh, president, John McCarter, wanted this to be a millennial event. And so uh, he had picked an opening date of May 17th, 2000. So both John Flynn and I gave a thumbs up. And uh, then John McCarter uh, put together a consortium of, of corporations and private in individuals. Uh, we thought that Sue might go for a couple of million dollars and, and you know the museum doesn't have that kind of cash laying around. So uh, he did some fundraising. Uh, the biggest uh, member of that was uh, McDonald's Corporation, which of course is an Oak Brook Corporation. They were wonderful to work with, very generous. Uh, they brought in Disney. Uh, they were uh, doing a project with Disney at the time down in Disney World. Uh, Disney was opening the fourth part of Disney World called Animal Kingdom. And McDonald's was producing a subsection of Animal Kingdom called Dino Land. So uh, with with uh, Disney and McDonald's and th then some uh, private donations, we had a war chest to go to the auction with in October of 1997. Um, I have a short video, the whole, the whole auction took only eight minutes. It started at half a million dollars and then went up by increments of a hundred thousand dollars. But I've got a, a short uh, 
version of this just so you can get a feel of, of what it was like. And you know, um, I just realized I need to set a setting for this. So I'm gonna stop the share for a second. Sorry about that. And then do it again and share sound. There we go. Okay. Now we're going back to the PowerPoint. So now you should be able to hear this when I started. If, if you guys can't hear sound, uh, let me know. And I begin with a bid of $500,000, now bidding at $500,000, now bidding at $500,000, $600,000, $700,000, now at seven, $800,000, now bidding at $900,000, now bidding at $1 million, now bidding at $1 million, $1.1 on the telephone, now $1.2 in the last row, $1.3 million, also in the lot, $1.4 million in the center, $5 million, $5.1, $5.2. Seven five. <laughs> seven million six hundred thousand. At seven million six on the phone. Fair warning then at seven million six hundred thousand. Up here. Seven million six hundred thousand. Now I'm gonna stop it just for a second to explain to you what you're about to see. We had a man literally doing our bidding for us. Um, he was a, a fine arts dealer. He knew Sotheby's like the back of his hand. And he said, uh, this is how uh, we're going to do field museums bidding. Uh, we're going to occupy an office overlooking the auction floor. We're going to keep the lights off in the auction, so in the office, so that nobody knows who's doing the bidding. And we'll phone in field museums bids. And so we have just won the auction, what you just saw, but at this point, nobody yet knows who the buyer actually is. And so the man who is doing our bidding for us, Richard Gray, he's about to step up to the microphone and uh, inform the world who just bought Sue. So let me restart it. This morning, I have the pleasure of having been awarded custody of Sue the world's largest and probably oldest young lady. She will spend her next birthday, her 70 millionth, in her new home on the shores of Lake Michigan. That is, of course, in Chicago at the renowned Field Museum of Natural History. Yeah, that still sends goosebumps down my spine when I hear that cheer. It was sort of the best case scenario everyone was wondering, well, you know, is someone like Bill Gates going to buy this or, or, or is it going to go into a public museum? And so when Field Museum was announced as, as the uh, winning bidder, it, as I say, it was really a best case scenario. Um, the, the, the dinosaur itself would go on display in a public museum and uh, it would be available for research by paleontologists all over the world. So now we've got a dinosaur, I got a call, I was in my kitchen, I wasn't at the auction, it was on a Saturday, and I got a call from my boss saying, well, we got a new dinosaur. And I think both of us were thinking, sort of two ends of the spectrum, very excited, but also, wow, we're gonna, we're gonna be involved in this major project with a lot of publicity. We knew that this project would be sort of done under a microscope, everyone would be watching our every move. So. And we, we had a deadline, which is unusual for our work. Um, so we got started. Let's talk about the, the preparation, the study, and the mounting of this dinosaur. So I was the chief preparator, and I sent half of the um, dinosaur down to uh, this new dino land at Disney World, and then half of it was to, was to be prepared here. But we have our own vertebrate paleontology research program ongoing here at the museum. And we have preparation labs that support that ongoing research. So we knew that we didn't want the Sioux project to get in the way of our normal ongoing research. And so we needed new preparation labs just for the preparation of Sioux. And until we won the, the until we won the auction, we weren't sure that we would need those. And so they were being built uh, as we were getting the project started. The first of the two brand new prep labs 
uh, opened at Disney World in April of 1998. And we were very excited about this. Disney World gets about 20 million visitors a year. So a lot more people would be exposed to our project uh, than if they only came to Field Museum to see it. Um, you know, there's, there's a great shot in, in the first uh, Jurassic Park movie. You see paleontologists out in the field and they're just sort of using a small brush and brushing away the gravel on top of this complete skeleton. We wanted to show people that it's not like that. In fact, it took my preparators 30,000 person hours just to take the rock off of the bone. So it's a long process. And by having it done at these two uh, exhibit prep labs, people could actually see what it was like to take the rock off of dinosaur bone. So uh, the, the Orlando lab got started in April and the McDonald's prep lab, which is here at the Field Museum, got started in June of 1998. Um, the McDonald's lab is now just one of our three regular research labs, but the, the lab down at uh, Disney World, once the Sioux project was done, they tore that, that building down and I think they put an underground roller coaster in its place. But uh, that, that's what happened to the labs. Uh, we hired a, a young postdoc, uh, Chris Groshu, to be the person to study Sue. One of the results of this project was that we wanted a monograph published. A monograph is a scientific study on one subject. And in this case, that one subject is the species Tyrannosaurus rex. Um, so we hired Chris, he had just gotten his PhD at the University of Texas in Austin. And uh, he specializes in crocs, which are a member of the group that dinosaurs belong to, the so-called archosauria, the ruling reptile. It includes crocodiles, birds, of course, every bird that's ever lived is a dinosaur, uh, non-bird dinosaurs, and uh, pterosaurs, the flying reptiles. Um, so, so Chris was well, um, informed on, on dinosaurs because he studied a, a closely related group. But an, another attractive feature of, of Chris was that he had gone through a program at the University of Texas that, that specialized in CT scanning. And we knew that we were going to want to CT scan at least the skull uh, rather than, you know, in the old days, you'd, you'd cut it up to see inside it. But nowadays, we can use CT scanning. Uh, so that's, that was another attractive feature of Chris. So he is the one that studied Sue and in 2003 published his monograph on Sue. And then there was another uh, facet to this whole project since this was one that was going on display. Uh, there was the team that created the mount, the metal armature that held all the bones together. And that crew was in New Jersey. Um, the head of the American Museum, which is in New York, the head of their mount shop, Phil Fraley, uh, he had already mounted the American Museum's T-Rex, as well as hundreds of other American Museum fossil vertebrate skeletons. So he won the bid to do the mounting for Sue. He asked for a leave of absence from the American Museum, and they weren't so wild about that. So he had to resign, but he started his own company Phil Fraley Productions and his first project was Sue. Uh, he rented a space in New Jersey. It was called the Johnson Atelier. I learned all sorts of new words with this project. I'd never heard of an atelier before, but I guess that's a, a sculpture studio. In this case, one that's several stories high. Obviously you need a big building to do a dinosaur mount inside of. And it was really Phil and his team that dictated the order of preparation of the bones. He said, look, this is a bipedal animal, two-legged animal. We're gonna start with the hips. So prepare the hips first and send those to me. And then the hind limbs, and then the vertebral column and the skull. So uh, that's what we did. And here you can see some shots. The, the armature is just beautiful. Uh, particularly before it was painted black. I loved seeing it. In fact, sometimes I wish I could push a button and have Sue disappear for a moment, just so you can see the artistry of this, this mount. It almost looks like liquid mercury just poured down the outside of the bones. 
And then there's another, yet another part of the project. Uh, we knew that not everyone would be able to come to Chicago and see the real bones in person. And so uh, we made molds of every single bone in Sue's body and sent the molds to a company outside of Toronto called Research Casting International or RCI. They uh, made plastic casts, very accurate casts of Sue and mounted those casts. And these two uh, plastic mounts traveled the, the uh, country and eventually uh, traveled the world. And millions and millions more people got to see Sue through these traveling ex exhibits. These are Field Museum's first traveling exhibits. And I love this shot because it's not often you get to see two T-Rex skeletons side by side. So once the mount was done, and, and we would of course make periodic trips to New Jersey to make sure that everything was going uh, right. There were a, a few hiccups as there always are, uh, but once the mount was done, uh, then it was taken apart and the bones and the mount were moved to Chicago. Um, you might think this was a gigantic job taking it apart, but in fact, the mount is designed to be taken apart easily so that any bone can come off the mount for study. I'll give an example of that. There was a graduate student at the University of Chicago who like the rest of us was interested in what these tiny little arms that T-Rex has if they had any function or not. And Sue has the most complete T-Rex arm. The right arm is almost complete. So she wanted to study it, but you know, the armature, the metal holding it together hides some of the surface detail. So she wanted it with, you know, taken off the, the skeleton, which sounds like an outrageous request, but we anticipated this. And the, the mount was made sort of like a, a, a tinker toy. It's made to come apart. So for a couple of days, we, we had had the arm off up in the lab so she could study it. And so Sue was sort of a one-armed bandit for three or four days. So here you can see shots. Uh, this is the uh, Phil Fraley crew putting Sue back together behind a barricade because we wanted to unveil it on May 17th. Um, and the plan was to do it live on the Today Show and Good Morning America. So let's talk about that. It was quite the media circus. Uh, the, whoops, let's go back one. The, uh, the plywood barricade around Sue was replaced by a double set of curtains. And this is called a double kabuki, sorry, double kabuki drop, yet another term that I learned in this project. And they practiced dropping the curtain over and over and over throughout the uh, night of May 16th into May 17th, so that they knew that when it was done live on, on the uh, Good Morning American Today show is that it would go without a hitch. And I've got another video. This is sort of a compendium of some of the news coverage of that day. So let's do that. From NBC News, this is Today. After 67 million years, Sue is about to make her entrance. There is a lot of excitement at Chicago's Field Museum this morning over a bunch of old bones. And these aren't just any old bones. This is 2020 Wednesday. Live on our show, we're going to unveil Sue, a 67 million year old dinosaur, the most complete Tyrannosaurus Rex skeleton ever found. And what will visitors to the museum, John, be able to learn about a, a T-Rex firsthand? We've made it so that people can get up eyeball to eyeball with the real skull. You can see all this stuff with your own eyes and, and know that it's real. Chicago still has Oprah and Sammy Sosa, but it's been missing a big star since Michael Jordan retired. Well, today, it got a new one, one for the ages. Goosebumps right now. It's just incredible. And I've seen a lot of entrances, but that was a very special entrance. I like that it's like so big. Would she have been at the top of the food chain during her time? Yeah, there wasn't anybody that could mess with Sue. I think it's magnificent. It's very cool. 
We leave you tonight with the biggest, most complete T-Rex skeleton ever found. A star was born today in Chicago. So that's what it was like on opening day. And that year was one of our banner years as far as attendance. We had to use the emergency exit. The lines were so long and we didn't want people to have to wait outside too long. McDonald's put up folding tables out in the hallways just to accommodate the huge crowds. It was really quite an event. Okay, so Sue's on exhibit. Um, one of the outgrowths of this project was that a donor was inspired by it and that donor um, donated money so that we could hire a dinosaur researcher, a permanent curator of dinosaurs. We did that in 2001. Um, Pete McVicky was the person that we hired. He's one of the most prominent dinosaur paleontologists in the world. He had just graduated from Columbia University in New York in, in conjunction with the American Museum in New York. And uh, Pete was with us until just recently. Uh, he and his wife are now uh, curators and professors at the University of Minnesota. And we, we miss Pete. But, we have just hired a new dinosaur curator, Jingmei O'Connor. She's amazing. And uh, I think uh, she'll uh, be one of the most high powered dinosaur, she already is one of the most high powered dinosaur researchers in the world as well. So we're very lucky to have Jingmei. So in the intervening years, we knew that Sue, you know, this is sort of the Rosetta Stone for this species because it's the most complete T-Rex. So we knew many, many paleontologists would come to study it. And indeed they did. Even the person who dug Sue up, Pete Larson. Uh, here you can see him studying the real skull. The real skull is never put on the end of the neck of a dinosaur because it's too hard to study up in the air like that. And so uh, we made a cast of this skull, corrected it a bit, uh, because you can see the skull is a little squashed as you would expect after 66 million years. So it's a plastic skull that's onto the end of the neck. The real skull is here in a bulletproof case. It rolls out on, on little uh, rails like a, a narrow gauge railway. And uh, then it, we can get it out of the case easily so that it can be studied easily. At, uh, in 2010, as a 10th anniversary project, um, we got money to scan Sue. The idea was that we wanted to create a three-dimensional computer model, which would give us the basis to estimate the mass for this dinosaur. Um, many, many uh, locomotion studies uh, have been done trying to figure out how fast this dinosaur was. And one of the main parameters in those locomotion studies is mass, how heavy is this animal? Um, we think that T-Rex probably could run, but didn't do it very often. It was, it was generally thought to be six to seven tons, uh, but Sue's bigger and using the skeleton, instead of just hiring a sculptor to sculpt what they think the dinosaur looks like, uh, based on the three-dimensional data, you can get a much more accurate estimate. And the estimate comes in at about nine tons. So when paleontologists thought it unlikely that T-Rex would run at six to seven tons, Sue makes it even less likely. But even at a walk, you know, those are very long legs and, and Sue could walk at something like 10 to 12 miles an hour. Um, I could not outrun Sue, I'll tell you that much. All right, uh, Sue was erected in the big main hall of the Field Museum called Stanley Field Hall. That was not meant to be Sue's permanent home. That was supposed to just be a temporary location. Um, when the museum was designed, the building, when it was designed, it had six courtyards built into it. It was an unair conditioned building. And you know, imagine when it's 95 degrees outside in Chicago summer. So these light wells allow light and air to get down into the exhibit halls and cool things off. And over the years, we have filled in those light wells for extra space. And uh, the second 
floor of the last light well to be filled in was to be Sue's exhibit hall, but we didn't get the light well filled in in time. And so Sue went on exhibit in 2000 in the big main hall of the museum. And we were thinking, you know, in two or three years, once the light wells filled in, then we can move Sue into its own exhibit where we can really put it in context, put it back into its Cretaceous world, so to speak. But it took, in fact, 18 years for the fundraising. It cost quite a bit of money, $16.5 million to move Sue and, and redo Stanley Field Hall. But we finally uh, got it. And in February of 2018, Sue was taken apart. We brought in RCI, remember they're the group that made the cast, mounted the two casts of, of Sue that would travel the country. They were brought in to take Sue apart and put it back together. Uh, we very carefully inventoried each bone as it came off the mount. This is Lisa Geiger, who is our uh, exhibits registrar. She and I worked very closely to make sure that Sue was cared for while it was taken apart. Once we took it all apart, then we moved it upstairs to its new exhibit hall. So let's talk about the remounting of Sue. It isn't very often that you get to remount a dinosaur. Um, there were parts of Sue that, that we did not include in the first mount, um, that we were able to include in the second mount. And you know, 20 years later, we just knew more about this species than we did when we first mounted Sue. So here's what the Sioux Hall looked like. Uh, just the shell has been completed at this point. And then uh, the vertebral column was not changed. So that went up right away and relatively easily. Um, but there were some changes that we made to the mount. And there are, they can be categorized in uh, six different ways. Um, the biggest change was that we added Sioux's gastralia. Here's the a picture of the original mount, and here's the mount as it stands now, and here are the gastralia. And you can see that that really makes Sue look quite a bit bigger. It, it, it lets you see where the outline of the belly would be. So uh, that was an important addition. So let's talk about gastralia a little bit. Um, gastralia are sometimes called belly ribs because they look like ribs and they articulate with the ends of the ribs, but they're not actually ribs. They form in the muscles of the body wall. Um, here you see a, a croc skeleton, a gavial, and these are the ribs, and then they articulate in the belly with the gastralia. And in fact, a turtle's uh, lower shell, its belly shell, are fused gastralia. And then uh, the next two uh, changes that we made to the mount are related to one another. When we first mounted Sue, we decided that we had it crouching too much. And so the knee, by bending the right leg so much that it sort of elevated the knee and it, it was sort of too close to the rib cage. But also the ribs were probably mounted in too barrel chested a fashion. So we cut apart the right leg and straightened it out a bit, as you can see here. And we also took the ribs and swept them back, which made the rib cage a little narrower. But that was constrained by the gastralia. You can't make the ribs too narrow or they won't articulate with the gastralia. So those are those changes. And then the next two are also related, uh, the wishbone and the shoulder, shoulder girdle. Um, we, we always had the furcula of Sioux, that, which is the term we use for the wishbone. Think uh, Thanksgiving turkey dinner. I'm sure some of you have enjoyed the tradition of, of taking the wishbone out of the, the uh, turkey carcass and two people pulling on it and whoever gets the biggest part uh, supposedly gets their wish. Well, the, the wishbone is a feature which is typical of carnivorous dinosaurs. It's the two collarbones fused together. And in a, in a theropod, particularly a tyrannosaur, the furcula, the, the wishbone should be this nice boomerang shaped symmetrical bone. And what we had instead was like so many of the bones in Sioux, pathologic. It looked like this. 
so it, it was it wasn't very boomerang shaped and we did not recognize it as the wishbone when we first mounted sue and so we basically created a wishbone we took a scientific guess at what it might look like uh, but in the intervening years after sue was mounted other adult t-rexes were found and they also had asymmetric wishbones and so we realized then that in fact we had sue's wishbone all along i don't know what these animals were doing to damage their wishbones but using the new one uh, it's smaller than the guess we took uh, originally and the shoulder blades articulate with the end of the wishbone so you can see a smaller wishbone brings the shoulders together which means that they don't fit on the rib cage where they did before they had to be brought forward and down a bit so it affords it, it affects where the arms are positioned on the skeleton as well. And finally, uh, we opened the mouth because why not, right? All right. Now let's let's talk a little bit about some new science that we were able to do be, while Sue was taken apart. Um, one of the things that we've been interested in uh, was how old was Sue when it died? We had taken a sample uh, of a rib. Uh, dinosaurs, like trees, stop growing during a season every year. And like trees, this leaves a ring. Now, we don't call these tree rings. We call them lines of arrested growth or lags. And based on that fragment of rib, we had uh, come up with uh, an age of at death for Sue at about 28 years. However, uh, when Sue was taken apart, it gave us the opportunity to sample several more bones from the skeleton. So we were able to sample the femur, take a core out of the femur, and we also got a sample out of the uh, right fibula to uh, see if those would uh, correlate with 28 years or if they were different from the 28 year estimate that we'd gotten off of the um, rib fragment. So here's a video. We used the big drill set to exhibit a diamond coated a drill, a drill chipping kit to take a sister core out of the left tooth. And then that core was cut in half, and one half was glued to a glass slide, ground down so thin that you could pass light through it. And then we could look at it under a microscope and we could count the lags of arrested growth. And based on this uh, and the, the data we got from the fibula, uh, it turns out that Sue's older than, we, than the rib fragment indicated. We think Sue is maybe as old as 33 years when it died. And let me finish up my talk with uh, showing you what the new hall looks like. So this is Sue's new home. Uh, we really put Sue into context. We show the animals and plants that were alive at the same time. There are six giant glass screens behind Sue. And if you stand in just the right spot, the images projected on these screens coalesce together into one big image. We commissioned three animations to be made by a British company to show what Sue's Cretaceous world was like and, and show Sue doing different behaviors. And I've got a little clip from one of those animations that I'd like to show you. So when you want to think about what Sue's time, you can use the gonna buy you heavily really just a bunch of really large animals. Of course, you can
So that scene that you just saw indicating Sue getting wounded by a triceratops horn, there is the left fibula in Sue is hugely infected. It's not a broken bone, it's a, it's a bone infection. And we think there might be two likely ways that happened. One is either a strike by triceratops, as you just saw, or maybe an ankylosaur. These are these big armored dinosaurs, some of which have tail clubs. Um, if Sue was hit by that tail club, it could have injured the fibula as well. So those, it's sort of a guess on our part to explain what we see, yet another pathology in Sue's skeleton. And uh, that's the end of my talk. I'll end with a picture of all the talented people that created Sue's exhibit. I hope you can all come to the Field Museum and, and see Sue in person. So now I'm going to turn off my screen share, mute the And my colleague Kate has kindly offered to be the camera person for all of this. Thank you, Kate. Hi. <laughs> so let's talk about the room that we're in. Um, about one half of 1% of the fossil vertebrate collection is actually on display. So a lot of people, you know, when people come to visit the Field Museum, they see our wonderful exhibits and they think, well, that's, that's Field Museum. In fact, that's just the tip of the iceberg. We have huge research libraries behind the scenes. And these libraries, like any good library, need librarians. We call these libraries collection readers, and the librarians are called collection managers. I'm the librarian or the collections manager for the fossil vertebrate collection. And I have five different collection ranges to house this huge collection. There's the fossil fish collection. There's the fossil herp collection. Herp is a shorthand that we use to mean fossil reptiles and amphibians. There's the fossil mammal collection. There is a lag deposit of mounted skeletons in an old exhibit hall that we don't like to, once you mount a skeleton, it costs so much money, you don't want to take it back apart. Sue, for example, was a, just mounting it was $2 million. And then the fifth uh, vertebrate paleontology collection range is the one we're in here, the oversized range. And it's this is where all the dinosaurs that aren't on exhibit are kept, as well as any bones that are so big and heavy, they need a forklift to lift them. I don't know if you can see that in the far background, but this room is sort of a bone warehouse. All, most of the fossils are on pallets which the forklift can easily lift up and manipulate. So it makes it safer, not only for the fossils, but safer for those of us that have to move these large bones. Uh, yesterday, I did a program from this room for our members' nights, and I had to use the forklift to get a bunch of bones down that are now back on the shelf. But we'll talk a little bit about those here in a minute. Um, this room houses about 1,500 specimens. So really in terms of numbers, not that many, but these are our biggest specimens. The heaviest ones are these big sauropod thigh bones, which are kept on the floor. They're so heavy there. Each one is about a half a ton. So there just isn't shelving that is heavy duty enough to uh, house them. And so we make these custom made plaster cradles to distribute the immense weight evenly over the support cradle. So each one of these cradles uh, uses about 200 pounds of plaster. I made most of them myself about 40 years ago, and the bones have not broken. Uh, the next lighter class of material is on these shelves, which do not move. And then the rest of the room is compact. Um, some of you, I'm sure, have seen. Uh, compactors and libraries and in doctor's offices, uh, but they allow a tighter packing of material of specimens per square foot because 
in a in a traditional collection range, there would be a row of cabinets and an aisle, a row of cabinets and an aisle. So half the room is aisle. But if it's compactorized, you can put the aisle wherever you want it. So most of the room is compactors. And half of the compactors are long span open shelving for some of the smaller but still big fossils. And then the other half of the room is actually cabinets. And you might wonder why would we have cabinets in an oversized range? Well, the entire fossil bird collection is down here. And as we've already alluded to, every bird that's ever lived is a dinosaur. So they belong down here as well. Kate, I'd like to show one behind you. So we're going to turn yeah. around here. Thank you. What I'm about to show you is a holotype. So let me describe what that means. If you find a new organism, living, extinct, plant, animal, it doesn't matter for you, you get to name it. But for your name to be valid, you have to publish a detailed description of your new organism in a widely disseminated journal so that your scientific peers have a good chance to read it and therefore judge your science. But also you have to pick generally one example of your new name. It's, it's basically the physical definition of your new name. And this, this one example is called a holotype. So these are like the rock stars of natural history collections. And what I'm about to show you is the holotype skull from a flightless carnivorous bird that was one of the main predators in South America when South America was an island. They're called terror birds. So this is a real skull. This was dug up in the 20s by Elmer Riggs from Argentina. And you can see it looks kind of like a hawk, except it's way, way bigger. So this is the holotype of the species Andalgalornis ferox, the ferocious bird from Andalgalo. And we'll see another holotype here in a minute. So these bones were largely collected by our very first paleontologist, Elmer Riggs. He was given the job of finding a dinosaur complete enough to put on exhibit, so something over half complete. Let's start over here, you can see two gigantic shoulder blades. Um, and you can see that the shoulder blades are curved. In fact, here I can turn it, you can really see the curvature. They lie over the ribs. So in your mind's eye, we construct this rib cage that this huge shoulder blade is lying on. This is one of these big sauropods, the long necked long tailed dinosaurs. And that's what most of these initial bones that I'm showing you are from, big sauropods. This is a femur and a shin bone, the tibia, from a titanosaur. These are the biggest dinosaurs that ever lived. They're the most advanced sauropods. We have a cast of Patagotitan where Sue used to be up in the big main hall. Um, that is currently the largest dinosaur known. And these bones represent a very close rel relative of that titanosaur. In Patagotitan, the femur is a, almost eight feet long. This one's about six feet, seven inches long. So almost as big. And then these three thigh bones, they all happen to be right thigh bones, just the one of the draw. All three of these come from the late Jurassic rocks of the Morrison Formation uh, from out west, Colorado, Utah, uh, Wyoming. This one's a little smaller. This guy is only about five feet long. This one is from the animal that was originally called Brontosaurus, is now called a Patasaurus. Uh, it's six feet long. And then the biggest one is Brachiosaurus. And this is actually Field Museum's first new dinosaur discovery. Again, in Elmer Riggs. Uh, his preparator, we talked about what a preparator is. 
His preparator, Bill Menke, discovered this on July 4th, 1900. And so originally Riggs thought this was, you know, the biggest dinosaur known at the time was Brontosaurus. So Riggs thought that's what he had. But what, and what he found was about 20% of the skeleton. So not complete enough to mount, which frustrated him. But I, he says that were it not for this rib, he might not have even collected it. He thought it was just sort of the scrappy brontosaurus. I mean, he, he was hoping for something better. But one of the ribs that they found, and it's this one, is nine feet long. So in your mind's eye, I'm six feet tall. Imagine a nine foot uh, rib cage. This whole rig is that this was either a gigantic brontosaurus or a new dinosaur even bigger than brontosaurus. And in fact, it was the latter. Once they got all of the rock down in the lab, got all of the rock off the bones, uh, they realized that they had a, a dinosaur even bigger than brontosaurus, which means again, uh, Riggs now got to name this animal. And unlike most sauropods, this was the first one that had ever been found in which the front legs are longer than the hind legs. So he envisioned this as the giraffe of dinosaurs. And he called it, he named it Brachiosaurus, which means arm lizard. And then every species name is actually a binomial, like our own is Homo sapiens. The species for this is Brachiosaurus altithorax, altithorax meaning deep chest, but that place on the nine foot rib. So academically, Riggs had had spectacular success. Uh, by 1903, when he described it, the world now knew what the world's biggest dinosaur was. Um, but he also found a brontosaurus that was about 65% completed. So that was the dinosaur that he prepared and put on exhibit. It took years to get that specimen prepared. He did not have 12 preparators like I did at my disposal during the Sioux project. He had one or two preparators. So uh, his brontosaurus went on display in 1908. However, he did not use that name. Since he was being asked to collect dinosaurs, he became a dinosaur expert. He's a mammalian paleontologist. But he went around and studied all of the sauropods in other collections that have been collected, he realized that there were two names for the same dinosaur, Brontosaurus and Apatosaurus. And the, the rule is that whichever name is published first is the senior synonym, the actual name. And any other names for the same organism are junior synonyms. So in 1903, he synonymized Brontosaurus under Apatosaurus. And it has stayed that way until a few years ago when a huge study came out resurrecting Brontosaurus. Uh, and the way science works is you publish your study and then you see how it's received by your peers. And we're sort of still in that period of time. Some paleontologists believe this author is correct that Brontosaurus is different from Apatosaurus and therefore is valid. Other paleontologists still think Riggs is right, that they're the same animal. So we'll see as time goes on, which opinion wins out. How are we doing on time here? You know, it is 149. Yeah, maybe we should uh, think about uh, hitting a few high points and then going to QA. Sounds great. Uh, these are the backbones of the type specimen of Brachiosaurus. So there's a femur and then there's a humerus, which is even larger. That's on the so I don't have that to show to you. There are four ribs. There are seven backbones from this part of the chest, which articulate with the, the uh, sacrum, which are five backbones squeezed together to support the huge weight of the hind legs. Here are some of the, the ribs. That's an ilium, uh, one of the hip bones. You can feel your own ilium right below your belt, that ridge. And then that bone is the part of the scapula. Remember, we looked at the scapula coracoid. That's actually the coracoid, the bottom of it. And then in adult, the coracoid, as you see in those, would fuse to the scapula. In Brachiosaurus, it's not fused. So as gigantic as Brachiosaurus is, it was the biggest dinosaur from when Riggs described it in 1903 until the early 1980s. So as big as it is, it's a juvenile. 
The coracoid is not fused at the sample. And then finally, there's a couple of tail vertebrae you can see next to it. And then a few of the other five points. Uh, again, Riggs in 1921 this time, uh, digging up in Alberta, Canada, uh, he dug up a baby tyrannosaur, not tyrannosaurus, but an earlier, more primitive relative called Gorgosaurus. And you can see it here. For the parts that are preserved, it's mainly from the hips back. It's for that part, it's even more complete than Sue. For example, this is a 100% complete hind foot, just spectacular. And I brought a cast of Sue's foot just for a size comparison. So the adult of Gorgosaurus wasn't as big as Tyrannosaurus, but it was approaching it. So you can see this is maybe a five year old juvenile. And uh, it, bone for bone, of course, is exactly like, like Sue, just much, much smaller. And over here, we, one of our current traveling exhibits is dinosaur. We had a field program in Antarctica itself, and we discovered the apex predator from the mid-Jurassic of Antarctica and named it Cryolophosaurus. This is an artist's of what it might have looked like. Many of the bones are right now traveling in, in one of these traveling exhibits. But here you can see some of the bones from Pylophosaurus, a string of backbones. This is the scapular cord right there. This is what the skull looks like. If you all remember from Jurassic Park, there is a dinosaur that spit acid. That part is, is just fantasy, but that animal called Dilophosaurus, it has two crests. Loaf means crest. This animal, Pryolophosaurus, is a relative, but instead of the two loaves on the head, it had one loaf on top like this. Well, why don't we uh, do some Q&A while we still have a little time left in the hour? All right. Library team, do you want to read questions off to us or I can try to go in and find where people have been typing them? Sure, I can read some off to you guys. And um, before we get started, thank you guys so much. That was very cool to see. Um, we did get a lot of questions, but there's a lot of repeats too. So hopefully we'll get through the majority of them. Um, why don't we start by you, you guys can give some general information. Um, to what extent are you open? Can people get tickets? I can answer that. All right. Hi, uh, I'm Kate Kolbeski. I'm a science writer for the museum. Uh, the Field Museum is open. You can come on down. Um, when I got here today, plenty of people. Um, and uh, yeah, so if you want to come, uh, we recommend buying tickets in advance just because we're at slightly less in capacity. Um, but you can probably get your tickets at the door and be just fine. Uh, right now we're open uh, five days a week, closed on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, starting on June 15th. We're going to be open seven days a week again. Uh, we just opened a brand new exhibit called Becoming Jane, the Evolution of Dr. Jane Goodall, which is really cool. Um, you can learn all about Jane Goodall and see like her childhood toy monkey and stuff like that, um, kind of tracking her journey to becoming the scientist and conservation advocate that she is today. Uh, any other general stuff, Bill, that I should? Uh, well, uh, we, I noticed people were here before nine o'clock. Are we opening earlier, like at eight or something? I don't think so. They might've been lining up. I'm not sure if maybe we have a special program for members, but. So it's generally nine to five. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm sure there's plenty of information too on your guys' website. So if you guys are still here with us today, you're welcome to visit there. Um, I might throw that link in the chat for you. Um, but let's get to some questions about Sue. Lots of people have questions. And one of the biggest ones is, how did you know that Sue is a girl <laughs> or was a girl? All right. So Sue scientifically is an it. We do not know what gender Sue is. And, and if I was referring to it as she, that's an old habit, which Kate has been trying to get me to break. And it, it hasn't working very well. Sue also has a wonderful 
media, social media presence. And in that venue, the, the pronouns are they and them and there. Uh, but we, in fact, don't know uh, the sex of Sue. So why is it called Sue, Bill? Oh, thank you. So Sue was dug up by a commercial paleontology company uh, owned by Pete Larson and Neil Larson. And Pete's girlfriend at the time was Sue Hendrickson. Uh, the guys had a flat tire in their, or a leaky tire in their field vehicle. So they went off to town to get that fixed. And Sue, clever enough, said, I don't need to help with that. I'm going to go look at those rocks over there that we've never looked at. And so she discovered Sue. And the way you discover a dinosaur, a big fossil like that, is that you see bits and pieces of it on the ground. We call these float because they're not in place. They've eroded off and, and washed down onto the ground surface you're walking on. They're sort of floating out of place. She saw a gigantic field of float, thousands of piece, little pieces of bone. She looked up and about eight feet up, there are these huge bones eroding out of the rock. So that's why it's called stew. Very cool. So somebody must have known that because we had a question. Curious if Sue Hendrickson is still looking for fossils. I, you know, uh, she has told me that she considers Sue her going away present to Pete Larson because they were just breaking up at the time. So uh, I think Sue does a lot of sort of underwater salvage archaeology, but I don't think she's doing paleontology anymore. Okay. Um, also, lots of questions about the bidding and who owned Sue before you are before the field acquired her. Them. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> so <laughs> Sue was dug up off of private land belonging belonging to an indigenous person named Morris Williams. Um, a five thousand dollar check changed hands. And depending on who you talk to, it was either purchasing Sue, that's what Pete Larson said, or it was just for the right to look around on the land, which is what Morris Williams said. Since there was a disagreement, it eventually went to court. There was this huge show trial and the judge awarded Sue back to the landowner, Morris Williams, who then put it up for auction through Sotheby's in New York. And that's, it's at that point the field museum got involved. Okay. Um, let's see. Somebody wants to know, should you be wearing gloves when you handle the bones? That's a very good question. Uh, if I were in anthropology, absolutely. I have a little bit different view of that. I try and keep my hands clean. Um, when you handle fossils, particularly vertebrate fossils, which are fragile, you're not as reliable with gloves on as you are with your naked skin. Uh, our, our hands are amazing things. And so I would prefer that people handle fossils with clean, ungloved hands. Uh, also, the things in anthropology are more likely to be damaged by oils in the skin than 100 million year old rocks, which is what most of these fossils in this room are. Yeah, I would add this, uh, Kate here. Um, so it's kind of a misconception, people thinking about fossils specifically as bone, um, whereas these fossils that we're looking at, they were once bone, but that's not what they're made out of now, they're rock. Can you talk a little bit about that, Bill? Yeah, it's, it's a bit of information that as paleontologists, we don't generally care about. But when we have analyzed it, it's always turned out to be a combination of original bone and replaced mineralogy. Uh, there is a very large sauropod that was found in Arizona. And the bones are white. And, and you can tell just from looking, almost none of these bones are white. I mean, the, these are casts. Of yes, it's not real. So when you find a white fossil, and this sauropod was 100 million years old, it was a real shocker to see the bones white. And so the paleontologists with that study wondered if in fact they're white because this is still mostly original bone. So he actually did the chemical test 
And that's exactly what it was. So you don't always get this. There's two things that go on. There's a molecule by molecule replacement of the bone. And it's done, even after that happens, you can look at it under a microscope and see that it, the cellular structure is still preserved. But there's also this process, which is called permineralization, which is the infilling of all of the voids in the bone with minerals that are precipitating from those that are dissolved in the groundwater that's flowing through the sediments and the bones. So it's a combination of original bone material and replacement bone material. Yeah, so it basically ladders up to when you're holding a fossil, most of what you're holding is not the remaining bone. Most of it is probably gonna be rock that has kind of filled in the spaces where the original bone used to be. Yeah, an original bone, even these big things would be much lighter because they're largely hollow. Um, that's one of the sort of free adaptations for flight that some, one group of dinosaurs used to become birds. Okay, that's good to know. That answers um, a couple more questions people had about rock versus bone also. Um, what else do we have? A couple more minutes and then we'll... Well, ask about Sue. Um, how did Sue most likely perish? Um, a lot of people are interested because you mentioned Jurassic Park, <laughs> that how much of Jurassic Park is uh, fantasy versus reality? <laughs> Um, it's all real. <laughs> Jurassic Park, I can tell you that vertebrate paleontologists love the Jurassic Park movies. They also love to make fun of the Jurassic Park movies. So it's a love-hate relationship. There's a lot that's very accurate in those movies. But for example, the dinosaurs are all larger than life. And, and you know, it, it, it's always struck me that the dinosaurs are already larger than life. Well, I improve on that. Uh, Steven Spielberg actually came and visited us in the middle of us preparing Sue, and we had the foot just like it is here. This is a cast, but we had the real foot propped up with sandbags. And he looked at it and said, "Oh, is that all the bigger it is?" And we said, "Yes." And this is the largest T. Rex known. So yeah, it, we we we've all enjoyed those those Jurassic Park movies, but they're they're not completely accurate. You know, it's entertainment. We don't expect it to be a scientific treatise on dinosaurs. And I'm guessing the question people have is related to like, so can you bring back a dinosaur using dinosaur blood preserved in amber from a mosquito? Yeah, probably not. DNA is a very fragile molecule. Um, I think there's some chance of it occurring for say frozen mammoths from Siberia, which are only say 40,000 years old rather than 100 million or in Sue's case, 66 million. I think it's unlikely that we will find enough DNA from a 66 million year old fossil to resurrect the species. And then of course, there's the other ethical question, should we do it? That world no longer exists. Where are they gonna live? How are they gonna be taken care of? Turned out so well for everyone in Jurassic Park yeah, right. then. <laughs> um, and I think the other question was, how did Sue die? Yeah, we really don't know uh, how Sue died. There are, there's damage, well, there's pathologies throughout the skeleton. And Sue is the, if not the oldest, one of the oldest T. rexes known. So that's sort of what you would expect. I'm 68, I've got lots of arthritis. Sue showed lots of arthritis. So Sue is an old T. rex, but we don't know what it died of. There have been some speculation. Sue has holes in its uh, lower jaws, which some people have compared with a disease that modern birds get that forces them to starve to death. But the, the jury's still out on that. We don't know why Sue died. Okay, just in old age. Thank you. Yeah, people were wondering whether she was considered a young or an old dinosaur. So. Very old, very old species. All right. Well, thank you guys. Before we wrap up, um, we've got lots of comments about how knowledgeable you both are and many thanks from everyone in attendance. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to be where you are with the Field Museum? Sure. Um, I grew up in Winnetka, which is the northern suburb of Chicago. And my mother would bring me to Field Museum when I was a little kid. 
buy me a bag of plastic dinosaurs and dinosaur books, and I never looked back. Um, I had an uncle who used to make great fun of me. He said, kid, grow up. You, you need a real job. You're never going to get a job in paleontology. But here I am. I've been at the Field Museum for 42 years and enjoyed every moment of it. And uh, as I find the thing to turn, apologies, the camera's on a like a weird gimbal device, making it harder for me to switch it. Hi, so I'm Kate. Um, I'm a science writer at the museum. I've worked here for about eight and a half years now. And my story is not unlike Bill's in a lot of ways. Um, I'm from the Northwest side of Chicago. I came here all the time as a kid and I thought that I wanted to be some sort of scientist. I have an undergraduate degree in chemistry. And when I was about halfway through undergrad, I realized that while I really love science and I love reading about it and writing about it and talking about it, I do not actually enjoy doing it. Uh, so I realized I should not make a career as a lab scientist. Uh, so I wound up doing a bunch of other writing, uh, you know, graduated uh, with degrees in chemistry, French and English, got a master's in science writing, but um, yeah, really lucked into a position at the field. Um, I came to one of our members nights, met somebody and, uh, you know, I got their card a year later. I got an internship and that turned into one job, turned into another job, turned into another. And uh, yeah, so now my main job is writing about the research that our scientists do and telling reporters about it so that they can cover it in places like the New York Times. Um, and then I also do freelance science journalism and run a science comedy show, things like that. So yeah, lots of, lots of science communication. Very cool. Awesome, guys. So are you the person behind Sue's Twitter account? Because I have lots no. of people here saying Sue that. Sue writes their own, I don't understand. Sue writes their own tweets. <laughs> okay, we got it. <laughs> lots of people saying how hilarious it is. So props to you guys, or props to Sue for that. And lastly, let's, let's get one more question. Lots of people are asking, so then why are dinosaurs extinct? What, what happened ultimately? Well, the smart alecky answer is they're not extinct. There are 12,000 species of dinosaurs alive, a dinosaur alive today. Every bird that's ever lived is a dinosaur. And so in fact, dinosaurs are still more numerous than mammals. There are something like 6,000 species of mammals alive today. But to take your question as it was meant, what happened to the non flying dinosaurs? Uh, it's pretty well accepted now that a really large asteroid struck the Earth about 66 million years ago uh, near the Yucatan, the current Yucatan Peninsula. And it threw up so much dust into the air that it precipitated what's called the nuclear winter scenario. You get dust spread worldwide. It shuts down the photosynthetic pathways so the, the plants die. The plant eaters that eat the plants die. The carnivores that eat the plant eaters die. And so the, the food chain basically collapsed. It's one of the two greatest extinction events in the rock record. OK, well, that is kind of sad, but also, I guess, cool to hear that maybe they're still, maybe they're not extinct, you know? Um, so again, it's about 2.10. I think we're going to wrap up. I, I thank you guys so much. This was so cool to be able to see um, the oversized room. Lots of people laughed at that also. Um, and I just, I'm, I'm very happy that we were able to offer this today. If you guys are still out in the audience, I invite you to stick around for just a moment after I end the webinar and fill out the short survey for us. Um, we'd love to hear your feedback and we're so glad that so many of you can join us today. Um, Everybody have a wonderful weekend, and I hope to see some of you next week when we visit the Elmhurst History Museum. Bye, everybody. Thank you, William and Kate. You bet. Bye. Bye.